Hi, Claire. Hi, Sajid. How are you? Fine. How are you? You you must be having a hard day. <laughs> oh, it's, um, I'm afraid the uh, the last one went used the full 50 minutes, and yeah. uh, um, I was just talking to and I um I did mention to uh, Dakchita that I have some there's a session straight after this. Yeah. Um, and if we could just finish, you know, make sure we wrap up within five, even better, ten minutes, that would be fantastic. It, it really depends on um, how many people we get to join. Uh, we had we had a lot of uh, fantastic conversation in the last um, sessions that I've been at. So yeah. um, hopefully this will continue. How are, how are things with you? Um, everything is good. Um, so yeah, I've been looking at the the talks and the, the workshops. So it's been great. Yeah. So and then a new experience also. So this is—is is this your first um, e, happy day conference? Yeah, and it happened to be a, a live one as well. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Um, hi, Dakshita. How are you? Hi, Claire. Nice to meet you. Well, well, I love to meet you properly. It's always nice well, to see. You. you know, here we are in this virtual world. We really should be kind of shaking hands over our, um, yeah. the physical world, but I know. But so glad that. I'm I'm so glad that we still continue to do this in spite of all of this. <clears throat> yeah, and I think um, you know what's also um, interesting to ask is is are these virtual conferences actually now more inclusive for people? Um, we've been having conversations yeah. among um, our women in APIs community about you know does does the fact that people can now join a conference from anywhere uh, does that mean more people can actually get to learn from? You know what's going on globally. Um, you know, is it easier for them to do, or is it actually harder because they're so exhausted by how much time they're having, uh, you know, in front of screens that um, you know, yeah. running this sort of thing at, at home is is maybe difficult. So we're we're not sure, but we yeah. like to think that. I think it's more useful because you, I mean, I mean, the biggest advantage is you get to interact with the speakers even though you're not attending the conference in person. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I think. There's something about the online chat format is interesting. Um, uh, you know, it's different than handing a mic around, you know, uh, in the audience at a stage. Um, yes. uh, you know, is that more or less intimidating? Is it easier or, or not for people to talk about? I, I think there's, they're, they're important questions, actually. It's different. Yeah. I think there are pros and cons, but I would say there are definitely a lot of pros. I, I think so. I think I, 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 the balance seems to be that... Um, uh, you know, even even when people can travel more, and uh, you know, it, it seems like a lot of this virtual experience will be here to stay. It'll be more hybrid than, uh, right? Um, yeah. You know, just, you know, fully um, face to face or fully virtual. Yes, definitely. There will um, be changes for sure. Mm, absolutely. Are you? Are you? What are some of the big changes that you've seen at uh, WSO two in how you work? Yes, yeah, so we have been working from home since March. I haven't stepped into the office since March. Um, while it's been great, I mean, I like working from home, but it's also, I, I've been missing the social aspect of all of it. So uh, that is something I really miss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Sajit? Is it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the same, but it's just that, I mean, it took some time for me to adapt to this, you know, new normal, <laughs> like, you know, being in, being at home with kids and, you know, other household stuff and still maintain, to, you know, <laughs> to keep That's working. Yeah. yeah, it's a little hard, but yeah, it took some time for me to get adjusted, though. But I think uh, pretty much I would favor this way of working rather than going to office every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? They, yeah. I think at the start of the lockdowns and things, they were saying that, uh, you know, a habit takes, I can't remember how many days, it's like a month or something, um, or or two months for you to get into a habit that, uh, um, that sticks. Hey, we've all had more than that. So, um, uh, This is great. We've got quite a lot of people joining us in the, in the, um, in the session. Uh, who, by the way, we are live. They are listening to this conversation. Oh. Um, so... Uh, uh, I might just give it maybe another minute in case anybody's uh, rushing from one of the other tracks. Uh, um, although we've just, yeah, she was straight after a break. So um, we're, we're on uh, uh, 3.30, so I think we um, should start right away. Okay. Um, so welcome. Welcome to those of you in the audience. Thank you very much for joining us. And particularly welcome to Sajit and Dakshita from WSO2, um, who are... Uh, 
uh, are a gold sponsor of this event. And what that means is that actually the, all of you in the audience, in the community more broadly, um, can participate in these types of events um, and register from anywhere in the world. Uh, it is only thanks to us, thanks to our sponsors, that um, uh, people can in, you know, invest and learn from uh, this opportunity of being in the community. So we thank you both very much, and uh, um, would love for you to um, uh, introduce yourselves. Uh, and I should say to everybody, uh, if you haven't been to one of the roundtables at an API Days event before, uh, the online chat is your opportunity to um, ask questions. We, we keep this um, as much more conversational than a presentation style. Um, it's, a, it's a chat and we really welcome any input um, from those of you uh, um, listening in. Uh, so do ask any questions, uh, it's a great opportunity. We have some from people, people that are pre-registered. Um, and uh, this session could run, we probably run for about 40 minutes. Um, uh, uh, we have up to 50 in the timetable. Um, but uh, yes, there's many of you now joining us, so we look forward to having you uh, in this session. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so uh, I'll start with the introduction to myself. So yeah, so I'm Sajid. Um, so I'm working for WS2. So I've been working um, for WS2 for nearly a decade now. Um, so my main area of interest is on like streaming-based integration. So I'm actually part of the integration team at WS2. Um, yeah, so that's about me. Yeah, so um, I'm Dakshita Ratnayaka, and I um, work in the technology evangelism team at WSO2. I've been with the solutions architecture team previously and also the CTO office, and I have been um, talking about WSO2 products and marketing WSO2 products and also dealing with customers directly to uh, come up with solutions architectures. Um, so thank you for having us, uh, Claire, and we're very excited to be here. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here. And um, uh, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to ask a very broad, broad question um, about how easy is it for um, uh, particularly maybe new uh, um, technologies, users of your, your solutions and platforms, how easy is it to create APIs in your environment? What, what, what are some of the, you know, without maybe, um, do you use some slides if you wish, but uh, yeah. Um, do you want to go, Sajid? Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so when it comes to the dub, so so the main product that is you know uh, addressing this area of the API management is WS2 API Manager. Um, so API Manager actually it comes with uh, so uh, uh, user-friendly UI, which through which you can actually you know uh, create your APIs uh, by filling in a form and. It's, it's this uh, a UX that you know if you are a UI person or a business person, okay, you can just go and type in and then fill it the form and then uh, create it. And also, um, so so it will just guide you through. And also through the UI itself, you can do the management stuff and uh, move. Uh, I mean, advance your API through different stages in the life cycle, etc. And also, it does support uh, this uh, our open sp API specification. Uh, so, uh, so we have full uh, full support for the open uh, API specification. So, if you have your open API spec ready with you, so you can just upload it and get it deployed right away. So, without doing further steps. And also, there are other ways in which we, you can actually interact with the API. We have a, 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 a command line interface, which the DevOps guys love to use, so to make their uh, make their life easy um yeah so yeah so there are many ways in which uh, you can actually interact with the api manager and build apis deploy apis <clears throat> yeah so we, we think about the developers as well as the, the devops and different perspectives we try to you know uh, look at different perspectives and get uh, all of all the users at different levels to get adapted to the product uh, yeah uh, pretty easy yeah and actually, we've already got a question. Thank you, Ben, um, uh, about this perspective in terms of who's who's using this. Uh, talking about developers, but it, but increasingly uh, the no the low code no code uh, um, you know, uh, movement, if you like, is all about you know the less technical um, users. How 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 do you see um, your solution contributing into uh, that? Would you classify it as a, a low code no code platform? 
Yes, like I mean, so if you think about the API development itself, so it's it's a completely a no code solution. You can say it. So it's just that you don't have to um, write in any any code uh, or any scripting or as you know it. This is that you know filling up a form and then come up uh, filling up a form and uh, you know just tell okay this is the version that I would need to have and this is the name of my API and this is how the, my this is how my document looks like etc. So it's 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 completely a, a no code. So you can keep it that way if you like. But if you are more into you know scripting and all, and you like to work with specs etc., you write your open API and uh, uh, open API spec, and then you know get along with that part. So yeah. So uh, I mean, if you are looking at no code, yes. It is. So looks like we may have just uh, just lost that cheetah temporarily yeah probably um, uh, network leaks. yeah but um probably still join back there i think we can okay well um let's get um to the uh to the heart of the conversation yeah. um uh, this was um very much billed as a debate um as a, a round table about asynchronous web apis mm -hmm. uh in an event driven architecture um so what Maybe Dakshi, thank you. Welcome back. <laughs> um, uh, in the uh, 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 asynchronous APIs event driven architecture uh, debate, what, what are some of the best use cases that you've seen that are, are suitable um, for event driven APIs? Right. Um, okay, so let's just talk about the majority of web APIs today. Right. So, in the majority of APIs today, you get the client. Uh, <laughs> initiating communication by sending a request to the backend and waits for a synchronous response. But it's not optimal for, say, UI components that update based on a real-time events or backend state changes. So, and also waiting for a synchronous response is not scalable because it ties up um, various resources on the backend as well as communication with the client. So event-driven APIs as a result have emerged to address this problem. So um, let, let's talk about some event-driven APIs in action. So for example, if you receive a notification about someone liking a picture on Facebook or receiving a notification about someone reacting to a story on Instagram, a new WhatsApp message, uh, maybe if you have a stock ticker displaying price changes in stocks, if you have a bunch of widgets in some application that shows changing data uh, or a social stream um, like your Facebook newsfeed, which has to display the latest updates about what your friends have been up to. So those are uh, instances where event-driven APIs are in action, right? So if you, um, if you really want to, uh, if you're building applications that need to be updated real time or uh, based on near real time, Based on events, you will want to use event-driven APIs. Um, so basically update applications or UIs with real-time updates. Um, for example, it could be uh, you know, live transit updates in transportation scenarios. Then um, uh, if you take a look at live sports co updates, social stream, chat servers, and collaboration applications like say in the case of Google Docs or spreadsheets. So those are uh, instances where you would want to use uh, event-driven APIs. So um, another example, so if you want to build, say, a retail application, if you're an SI and you're helping to build a retail application, uh, maybe the front end wants to know price changes and updates on inventory. So with the traditional request response APIs, <coughs> They will need to get this information by polling the API continuously if you're going with that approach. Uh, so this overloads the backend system. Uh, there's latency involved. And then uh, sometimes maybe an API management system is present. In most cases, an API management system is present. And it will throttle out these requests, even though you can get around these uh, uh, limitations. Uh, but if the retail application is implemented in an event-driven way with event-driven or in synchronous APIs, the price changes are pushed to the client instead. So uh, what the client application would do in that case, uh, would they would uh, 
uh, any application that's interested in the price change event will subscribe to the event. And when that price change occurs, that data will get distributed out to the subscribed apps. Uh, so in that way, that app will, so those apps will no longer need to continuously query for the price. Uh, they can uh, get the latest price from the back end and keep this data in its cache or keep it persisted. And every time there is a data change, it will get notified. So it, it makes more sense to see push events through API through async APIs uh, than polling. So those are some instances why you would use async APIs. Thank you, and um, we've got uh, the questions coming thick and fast on the online chat now, which is which is great. Um, Ben's asked another question about um, EDA becoming as a distributed system, and how do you manage complexity of maintaining identity and availability at scale? Yeah. Um, so, Gita, you, um, would you be comfortable answering that one? And then uh, we've also got a financial insurance sector case study question. Okay. So, for Ben's <laughs> question. You can go from either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, Clara, so for the Ben's question, so actually, so it's one of the like the greatest challenges uh, when it comes to, you know, event-driven architecture or in, when it comes to, you know, uh, streaming technologies in general. So, it's just that, so, okay, how do I guarantee that my message is being delivered? What if happen if I lose one message, right? So, so, so for an example, if we think about these different types of, I mean, we talk about exactly once delivery, at least once delivery, and at most once delivery. So, most of these <coughs> applications, the real world uh, business applications, require at least one uh, type of delivery. Uh, so, but uh, in some cases, we also want at least. Uh, I mean, even though the delivery might be at least once, but the processing semantics has to be has to stay uh, in at least at uh, exactly once again. So, so therefore, um, so this, so in order to you know tackle these challenges, I think that they, we have to attack uh, approach this problem in multiple angles. Um, so, one uh, crucial uh, aspect uh, when it comes to solving this problem is like you know uh, using a proper eventing backbone. So, for an example, you know, uh, so that's uh, something like Kafka, right? So, which which, which is fault tolerant and also you can reply. Uh, I mean, replay events, etc. So, so having a proper eventic back, backbone infrastructure is critical. So that's one part of it. So, and also, uh, you might also, I mean, it, that it might, uh, that itself might not provide you the complete solution. Sometimes you might need to build your uh, applications with this, uh, this concerns in mind. For an example, let's say, uh, I mean, a, a very simple example would be an application. You, if you use the sequence ID, right? You sh the application can detect uh, duplicate messages and then uh, you know decide what to do, right? And also your services. When it comes to your services, they might need to have replace services also. I mean, taking into the account the fact that there can be cases where you know some apps have gone down, it might have lost certain messages. So there has to be a way to recover. So if so, what is the procedure? So there has to be services that is available out there for such cases to be handled. Um, so, yeah, I think there's no one silver bullet. So my answer would be, I mean, it has to come by design depending on the case, but in order to enable that, having a proper event in that bone is crucial. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, and I would like to make sure we get to, to Christian's question as well. Um, uh, maybe, Doug Chika, can you um, share some, uh, any examples that you've got in the financial insurance sector of um, of EDA style architectures, EDA, APIs, bed driven yeah, APIs. So, I mean, from the top of my head, I would say um, stock trading applications. Um, so if you take a stock ticker, uh, may, maybe um, um, let's say, uh, like let's say stock APIs or APIs maybe from stock exchanges. As a scenario, or, or else there might be various parties that have information on changes in stock data. So there might be applications that build stock tickers and uh, maybe interest rate capturing uh, widgets and things like that that need to be updated based on um, the changing information. So uh, in such applications, they would use event driven APIs to update the front end applications. So, yeah, that's so. great and um we've also got a question from guillaume um about uh, how an asynchronous api 
is managed in uh, WSO2 gateway. Um, uh, do you use HTTP? Um, uh, who would, is that uh, is that a question? Who would like to ask that question? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So I I, I, I would like to uh, answer. So so it's just that uh, clear, like at WSO2. So we are also like started exploring about you know this uh, asynchronous APIs and need for. So the, this rise of asynchronous API is such a different paradigm rather to, you know, in, in contrast to uh, trying to bind in or trying to, what do you say, mix up or hide it within REST itself, right? So 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 in the process, so what we realize is like, okay, when it comes to, if we talk about particularly about web-friendly protocols, right? So so we, we uh, so it's just that, I mean, so most of these web-friendly protocols are actually based on uh, HTTP, so for an example, web sockets. So, so it's of course on TCP, but you know, initial at least the initial handshake happens at HTTP level and server sentiment, right? So, so those are like the the, the 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 protocols that actually we are trying, we are planning to support in our uh, in our uh, first uh, releases. So, so, so that's our plan, uh, uh, very roughly. Um, and also, like, uh, so it's just that I mean, our approach is that we are not trying to um, build in uh, asynchronous or streaming API uh, concepts to the REST model itself. Rather, treat REST as a separate, uh, um, a separate type, and then uh, bringing the concepts required for the, the streaming API or the asynchronous API model, and then uh, give a like a first-hand asynchronous API. Uh, you know, a, Eventing, eventing native experience uh, to the users. Um, yeah, so that's what you want to add more. Or, right? um, and I got another question from Ben about support for async API specs. So, yes, yeah, so that's in the pipeline. We do not support it yet, but that's going to be available. Uh, so in the next release, right? Yes, in the next release, it will be available. So just like, I mean, if you are familiar with WS2 uh, API Manager, so just the way that we support open API spec for uh, REST APIs, we are going to do the same for asynchronous APIs as well, with async API. Great, thank you for, um, thank you for the update. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we actually had some questions that were sent in to us um, about async API. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, as part of the registration process. And um, uh, the comment was, why is asynchronous API tooling so late and under-equipped compared with synchronous APIs? Yeah, so. Yeah, so, so, um, so even though, like even driven architecture is somewhat an, of an old concept, um, event driven APIs are relatively recent, right? So REST APIs were more widely adopted at the time and a variety of API management tools supported these, uh, supported the, the REST APIs. So there were tools to support REST APIs, there were documentation aspects, there were testing tools and lots of things that came with API management tools, uh, API management uh, products. So, um, so also with more recent modern application requirements and with hyper-reactive UIs, uh, and also the wide adoption of microservices architecture, which is, which performs really well with event-driven concepts, uh, we can say that the adoption of asynchronous APIs also spiked. So uh, there was that need to document these APIs and allow users to generate client code, uh, etc. Uh, so now async API is pioneering this effort, and um, you know the, uh, it's a the async API initiative is a major initiative which has everyone's attention and it has made a good it has made good progress when it comes to standardizing and providing um, tools so uh, also we need to take into account the fact that async apis or asynchronous apis uh, it, it's complex it's complex and it's different compared to rest so with rest apis it's http based you just have to handle the either get request or a post request but um, with respect to asynchronous APIs, there are different protocols that you have to take care of, and these that are different, like they're, they're, they have nuanced needs. Like, for example, webhooks would uh, react differently, or you have to handle um, 
service and events differently, web sockets differently. So you have to address these nuances differently and documenting them, generating client code, et cetera, requires more effort. So I suppose that is what has been, you know, causing the delay and it's basically more difficult. Okay, um, thank you. And actually, um, Pasquale has asked uh, whether or not you've got um, maybe an architectural uh, schema or picture that might be able to help um, uh, frame some of these conversations. Um, if you, yes. I know we talked so earlier. I have um, a white paper that I can share with you right now. So we have oh, a diagram. Yeah, take a look. Um, and I've also noticed, um, as a reminder for anybody who's just joining, uh, that um, the WSO team uh, um, have a booth as well at the conference here, and you can uh, talk to um, uh, experts offline as well. Um, so we've got a couple more questions coming through. Um, so one is uh, from Jay. How feasible would it be to have async APIs for bulk data migration? Um, yes. Yeah, so so when it comes to uh, you know bulk data migration. Uh, so it, it sounds like you know it's more of a you know batch fashion uh, 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 processing, right? Um, so so actually, asynchronous APIs is tightly uh, coupled with the the the, the 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 notion of events. See, right? So it's just that uh, rather than uh, so if you think about it, rather than uh, you know sending uh, the button, okay, let's say there's this particular object that we are monitoring the state for, right? Rather than sending uh, the 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 complete state, I mean the state of that particular object after a certain time, we send updates incrementally in an eventing manner, right? So it's just that, so so the idea there is that you incrementally uh, transfer data from uh, from the source of originate, origination to the point of interest, right? So therefore, um, I would say like uh, for the, for the in, 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 for a use case like a bulk data migration, maybe, I mean, not uh, asynchronous API. So this eventing uh, can be used. Uh, I mean, let's say I mean if you want to move away from batch processing, and then if you want to incrementally send the changes across, right? So for for, for such, uh, in order to optimize your your bulk data migration uh, to a to a to a incremental change data migration, you can use actually eventing and asynchronous API. For an example, you know, the, the technologies like change data capture are becoming increasingly popular. Uh, due to this fact so with technologies like change data capture you can actually you don't have to do that overnight uh, huge migrations right you can flatten the the, the curve of uh, network bandwidth usage and cpu usage and then send the data changes as and when they happen um so uh, i would uh, like say like we could rather you know rethink uh, how we migrate data and then instead of you know doing this few big bulks at the night which require you to have, you know, a, a, a cater for the peak bandwidth and the cater for the peak uh, resource consumption. Rather, consider using incremental, uh, you know, propagating incremental updates as and when they happen. Um, so that way, I think, rather than you know, you know, implementing bulk data on asynchronous API, you can transform your data uh, transformation uh, method to a, a more lean and lean uh, uh, one. That's great. Thank you, um, Sajid. And we've got uh, another couple of questions. They're queuing up. Um, Antoine has uh, asked if it's possible for users to, to decide which events they want to receive and, and how would you recommend that that's best managed? Is that a question, Dakit, Dakshita, yeah. that you can help with? Okay, so I, I think um, with, uh, with GraphQL in the picture, I, I think uh, uh, you, you with, by using technologies like GraphQL um, subscriptions and live queries, which are rather new, um, you can, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with GraphQL patterns, then you can uh, specify what events you want to receive using the GraphQL principle. So that's one way of doing it. Um, Sajid, do we have any other ways of doing it? Yes. Yeah, so. Uh... So let me like so GraphQL is actually a one way, good way of you know specifying the way the what is the way in which you want your response. So let's mm -hmm. say I mean you are not you are not using GraphQL. So in such case, I think you have to in a proper event-driven architect, you have to organize your topics properly. 
so 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 they have to let's say you are only i mean you are running a market data system right so if you are only interested in uh, let's say order book updates then you can go and uh, go and connect to the order book update topic but then again let's say you are only interested in the order book updates for a abc symbol right so therefore then in that that case your your topic should support you know it, it's hierarchical structures likewise so so uh, i mean uh, i would say like so with with uh, the, the main one one way of uh, addressing that problem is like organizing your event flows into proper topics right so so that actually governed by the fact that you know what are the services that is out there so so how you this i mean the, the services that are coming into the system has to decide okay based on what he is trying to do it has to decide okay what are the topics that i'm going to subscribe to and what are the topics that i'm going to publish to so so that's the main way of controlling but i accept that like you know some brokers still don't support this hierarchical topics etc so it's a little challenging I, I, yeah so yeah but it's uh, in my opinion it's more on that side you know subscription Oh, thank you, Sajid. Um, we've got another question from uh, Guillaume um, about: Do you think a webhook pattern based on REST as an architecture is a good pattern for asynchronous requirements? So um, yeah, uh, so webhooks are rather easy to implement, and you can use it um, pretty easily. But webhooks are better for pushing notifications to uh, maybe one or a small number of endpoints, and they are not suitable to push events directly to client applications right because each client has to host an http endpoint this is the webhook or the uh, the callback api um so uh, so this uh, http endpoint is uh, has to be possessed uh, in possession of like uh, in a publicly addressable domain name and you have to secure this network so it's not uh, suitable for server to client communication but rather maybe definitely for server to server and uh, maybe for one or small number of endpoints so if your use case is such that you don't require um, uh, server server send or oh, basically events from the server to the front end uh, if you don't have clients or browsers that require this information then yeah webhooks can be used but Ben's just uh, made a comment as well about um, webhooks as the lowest common denominator. Easy to use, however, with HTTP2 multiplexing still being hard to scale. Uh, is, that a, is that a view you share? Do you share that view, Sajid? Um, um, yes, like yeah. So so uh, so webhooks like it's like it's like a, one of the early uh, facilitators of this asynchronous uh, uh, communication. So, so, but now you know, like uh, that should explain. Like now, the end use applications also wants to have this nature of asynchronous communication. So, therefore, the webhook will not be scalable, and it's not technical. It's technically technical implementation doesn't allow you to do that. So, so yeah, yeah, I pretty much agree with uh, Ben's uh, Ben's comment. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Um, one of the registration questions that we had um, was uh, whether. Asynchronous APIs are made for the streaming world based on Kafka. Um, do you have, uh, yeah. what, what, what's the team's view on that out of interest? So, um, so yeah, so I think, um, so the, not necessarily, I mean, so if we think of talk about Kafka in specific, like not necessarily. So the, the concept of asynchronous APIs actually I mean, had it came into uh, like uh, existence and popularity because like people started to realize okay first thing is okay now we uh, in order to provide your uh, new users with you know uh, interactive experience and rich experience you need to have this asynchronous communication so uh, and then people also started to realize okay uh, there are certain commonalities between the well established rest paradigm and this asynchronous uh, uh, asynchronous uh, way of, uh, you know, asynchronous way of communication. Uh, when I say it's a communication, the, the, the parties that is involved. So therefore, uh, in, so in, in a wake of, you know, recognizing this, so then uh, initiatives like async uh, document this communication, how you define this communication. So that's, I think, the most, uh, the, the, the reason for um, the popularity of the notion of asynchronous here. 
Um, so actually, uh, like the, 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 it doesn't actually make any assumption assumptions about the underlying technology implementation. So so it can be you know a Kafka broker, MQTT broker, MQT broker, or even it can be just uh, you know a WebSocket endpoint which is sending you events that was generated by running a CDC, uh, you know, doing a CDC on a DB that is sitting on somewhere. So, so that's true. But, but also we have to admit the fact that, you know, the popularity of Kafka and its, its powerful uh, technological capabilities made that e realizing ED ar architectures more easy. And um, yeah, so people started adopting that. So in that way, it has, all, of course, contributed to this, you know, rise of asynchronous API. Thank you. Um, thank you. I can see, um, actually, we've uh, we had a flood of questions online and uh, uh, now our, our audience is a little bit quieter. <laughs> um, but uh, no, that's good. I might um, uh, I might jump back if I could to um, a few of the, the, the questions that we got from um, people at registration. Um, uh, one uh, that was um, about how can you ensure cohabitation of APIs and events messaging on developer portals. A little bit of a change of tack. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's the same. Um, so, I mean, to ensure cohabitation of APIs and events. So, event-driven APIs and ordinary REST APIs can be advertised on the same developer portal, right? So, now if you, for example, the WSO API manager allows you to view your REST APIs your GraphQL APIs, your WebSocket APIs, all on the same portal. And the request dispatching also happens through the same gateway, right? So it can definitely happen. Um, and they can co basically coexist APIs and events on developer portals. So it's never going to be redundant just because it's a different type of API. Um, so API portals, which are separate from API gateways, they basically resolve problems around um, how to document your API, govern your API, and how to collaborate, how it allows you to uh, allows people to collaborate on the APIs. So with event-enabled APIs, uh, being able to have a place where you can advertise your events and uh, what schemas are available to use for those events, that can be done through an API management solutions portal. So that's something that uh, we're also working on. And um, with uh, the ability to catalog events and be able to explain how all the different events and of an organization are subdivided, like the different topic hierarchies, uh, all of that can be uh, specified in an event portal, right? Um, so, so with the API management solutions now supporting different types of technologies, um, they can definitely be an intermediary to manage the APIs while talking to the backend event driven architecture. So, API, uh, so the developer portals will be used for uh, ordinary REST APIs and events to coexist and basically to advertise uh, or, and, or make them discoverable to consumers. Well, thank you for sharing that, that insight. Um, uh, we also, we, we had a, a, um, an, another question which is a little bit of a sort of step back in terms of um, looking at the, the industry and the movement from a more of a, a broader perspective um, about how we can truly move to an API world where APIs are first class citizens for all interactions and provide all information for integration and event driven complexities in the modern connected world. Um, to, to me, is a somewhat philosophical question as much as a, uh, a technical um, one. Um, what would be, do you have any, you know, personal uh, insights or views on, on that, you know, for that question? Uh, Go ahead, Sai. Okay, so, yeah, so, yeah, I was just uh, trying to point out the fact that, I mean, I mean, we have to accept the fact that, like, you know, with the growing diverse needs that users have and, you know, the, 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 with the competitive nature, um, so, it's just that we can't stick to one breed of or one style of technologies and you know ex, uh, you know provide the deliver the, the, the experience that induce in customers and all your competitors are uh, delivering so therefore we have to uh, accept the fact that we have to embrace different types of technologies um for an example if you are talking specifically about apis you know you might need to use you know graphql apis at some point some point at rest apis and some point at event driven apis etc 
so so in the process of doing that so the, the, i mean different types of apis come with set of different set of tools and standards etc so it's just that we need to you know make our organize our our developer teams and our teams uh, agile enough or flexible enough to adapt to and you know use such different technologies where uh, for the for, for, for the case I think may just have a bit of a bandwidth to uh, you know uh, embrace uh, and also working. I think you. Sorry, will. actually, no, um, I'm afraid we just uh, we just lost, just lost Sajid briefly. Um, I think uh, okay. seemed like uh, a bit. I can continue with the question. So I, I think the question okay. was, um, how do we how how can we merge API led design with event driven architecture? Is that is that the question? That yeah, it was about that. That's right. In terms of um, you know expanding uh, the the scope and breadth and opportunity. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, so API-led design with event-driven architecture. So obviously, uh, you have to go for event-driven APIs, right? So, uh, if you implement your event-driven APIs and if it can connect with your backend event-driven architecture, then you can uh, enable an event-driven capability across uh, from from the front end to the back end through uh, by uh, by creating an API uh, enabled uh, event driven architecture. So, if you take uh, an event driven API, uh, it basically requires two capabilities. So, you have to uh, have a mechanism to allow consume, a consumer to subscribe um, and the means to deliver events to consumers uh, that have subscribed. And the event enabled APIs or services can connect to the broker and the clients can subscribe to a channel of interest. So, that's one way of doing it. So the client architecture will basically allow client components to subscribe to the state changes that originate from the back end. And um, so the typical back end architecture should ideally consist of uh, obviously the event driven APIs and a message broker. So event driven architecture does not explicitly require the use of middleware, but um, um, using an intermediary between event producers and consumers, that is a broker, it helps to uh, implement uh, reliable delivery and more manageable and scalable solutions. Basically, it, it takes care of all the complexities and it deals with the subscribers and all of that. So, so you have, so it's better to have an event broker. And obviously, there will be microservices. It's good to have microservices. Uh, that publish and process state change events. So the broker will receive uh, events from IoT devices, uh, backend legacy systems, maybe uh, it can connect to uh, the legacy systems through an ESP or maybe through legacy adapters. And you can use change data capture tools to understand what data changed. And all of those events can be fed to the broker, which will basically talk to the event driven APIs that will in turn talk to the front-end um, um, applications. Um, so the event connection between the backend and the web client can be established through uh, event-driven APIs powered by different types of API technologies. Um, I've, I've uh, talked about those uh, technologies in the paper I shared with you. So, um, so you can use webhooks, websocket, service and events, or GraphQL subscriptions, live queries, uh, depending on the exact requirement. So, with all of these, uh, with the back end event driven architecture and with all these technologies that enable event driven APIs, uh, you can definitely go for this API led design with event driven architecture. Thank you. Well, we seem to have lost Sajid again, unfortunately. Um, I'm also conscious that we're um, we are running quite close to um, the end of this session, so I've just invited anybody to answer 
uh, ask any last last question, burning burning questions on their mind. Um, uh, but maybe if if Sajit is uh, is having a few um, challenges technically, oh no, he's back. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, sorry about. No, no that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> We are getting um, close to the end of the session, actually, Sadiq, and it uh, doesn't seem like we've got more questions coming through on the online chat. So perhaps I could invite each of you to, to sum up um, uh, uh, sum up how, you know, your views and particularly how people can get in touch with you here. I know that you're at the conference for the next day and a half. You've got other WSO2 sessions and so on um, going on. Um, please, uh, Sadiq, would you like to speak first and then take sheet that goes up for us? Yeah, so so thank you very much, Claire, for having us. And so it's been a great experience. Uh, so having, I mean, having uh, the opportunity to talk as well as to listen to people talking and uh, share different views and and yeah. Uh, and also, I would, uh, I mean, I I will be very happy if you guys can you know come and talk to us and share your ideas, not just questions but ideas and etc. So that will be really helpful. So it's been a great experience. Thank you very much, Claire and the team. Yeah. Well. Thank you. Thank you to the organization as a, as a sponsor of API Days. I know that uh, the organizers are very, and all of the community is very, very um, appreciative of the generosity to make these uh, 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 opportunities available for, to so many around the world. Okay, so as closing remarks uh, regarding the topic, so um, event-driven applications, um, what, what I want to say is while they're really great, you still need traditional request response synchronous communication. Um, and, and what we believe is that you need to be able to combine event-driven APIs underpinned by an event-driven architecture uh, with traditional request response formats, right? And bring the best of both worlds to build the active client application and use an API management solution that can support uh, event-driven APIs as well as um, the usual synchronous uh, APIs. And that way you can uh, manage these APIs and basically uh, expand your business and um, allow your clients and uh, partners to build great applications. So thank you very much for having us, Claire. Um, please do visit the WSO2 booth um, for any questions you have regarding our products. And if you want to uh, be in touch with us, please uh, drop a chat and uh, we are very happy to get back to you. Fantastic. And we, we are absolutely privileged to have uh, um, people with your expertise and uh, experience um, and able to explain uh, uh, the concepts in such uh, um, straightforward and simple ways to the audience and, and so on. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I hope you have a great uh, rest, of, uh, rest of the conference. And uh, we will see you all soon. Thank you, Claire. See you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you to everyone in the audience for your time and uh, attention. Thank you. Bye.